for the invitation. It's great to be here. Great to see a full room also. Thank you for uh, taking your lunch time to come and learn a bit more about Facebook. Uh, um, and uh, thank you very much for uh, Catherine Tucker, uh, who uh, invited me to, to visit uh, Florida. Um, I have been here one time many years ago, but really it was not now that I really got to see more of the campus and get to know more of the university. So it's uh, great to, to be sharing with you uh, this, uh, this afternoon or this lunchtime. And the um, presentation will uh, focus on climate change uh, in the Mesoamerican region. Very conveniently, there was a map here already of Mesoamerica, so we'll keep it there uh, for reference. And actually, uh, that's a, a concept that is important to, to discuss a bit at the beginning, I guess. Uh, the difference between Central America and, and Mesoamerica, uh, the geographic Central America, the historical Central America, there are some differences, as you may know. Uh, traditionally, um, Central America uh, only included uh, party countries up to Costa Rica, because as you may know, Panama was part really of South America, South America part of Colombia. So at the time of the colony, uh, it was only Guatemala down to Costa Rica that was a single unit. Uh, and it was uh, uh, dependent uh, on um, uh, Spain, I mean, it was a colony of Spain. Belize is the only country in the area that speaks English, basically because of uh, invasion by uh, British uh, back uh, pirates in the area. So the, the, the pirates uh, started to settle, settle in the northern part of the territory. When the area became independent from Great Britain, from, from England, uh, this area remained uh, an English speaking area. Um, and this morning I was sharing with some of the students in Catherine that class that Guatemala still uh, demands that uh, some of the territory really belongs to Guatemala. Uh, even from the colonial time, Spain was always uh, uh, asking uh, the British settlers to, to move away from the area. So right now Guatemala is still uh, demanding that uh, about half of the territory from the lake should really go back to, to Guatemala. And hopefully in the next uh, two years, we will have a, um, a court hearing uh, about this, an international court, to, to decide who could write. Um, Belize has the backing of Great Britain, so they have a very strong <laughs> backing there. So it looks like we won't have a good chance. But in general, um, Belize is a, is a, is a, uh, a different uh, country in, in, in historically speaking and in terms of language. Uh, but beyond Central America, we can also talk about Mesoamerica. And Mesoamerica also includes the southern part of, of Mexico, as you can see in, in this map over here. And, uh, and, and that uh, has uh, some derivation from geography. You can see that really the, the central part or, or the isthmus part really starts from, from around here down to Panama. But also, uh, historically, uh, southern Mexico was part of Central America. When the area was a colony uh, of Spain, uh, the, the southern part of Mexico, especially Chiapas, Chiapas and Tabasco, were part of, of, of Central America. When Central America became independent from Spain, they joined Mexico immediately, and they stayed uh, as part of Mexico for a few years only. Eventually, they separated from Mexico, but when they separated from Mexico, Chiapas decided to stay with Mexico. And from and in then Japan, Chiapas is a part of Mexico. But if you if you visit Chiapas and you visit Guatemala, you will see that they are very similar because they are really uh, they were the really same territory historically. And the Mayan population uh, that uh, lives now in Guatemala also shared a lot of the history with the Mayan population of southern Mexico. Anyway, uh, that's a little bit of history and geography, uh, which you probably knew, but just to make sure that we are on this level. Um, and, but today the focus is going to be on climate change. It's a different topic. Uh, I know it's uh, not that popular to talk about climate change in, in this country nowadays. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start the presentation by reviewing some of the general concepts on, on, on climate change. Again, just to make sure that we are all 
at the same level of understanding of what the situation is. Um, uh, some of these, um, the majority of these uh, graphs in, uh, I'm going to show actually come from the last report from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that published uh, the fifth report uh, about uh, five years ago now. And uh, they are actually in the process of starting the sixth report, which is going to be uh, next year. So next year they start with the cycle. But uh, the graphs that I show here come from the latest report. And so we're going to start in a more general way looking at what's happening in the world. And then uh, from there, we're going to start focusing more in uh, Central America. So basically, uh, it's important to uh, recognize that uh, the last report was very significant because it was the last report, uh, the only report where ICCC had been uh, really clear in stating that there is no doubt that the planet is warming. Uh, there is enough information now in terms of temperature and also in terms of uh, uh, sea level rise, in terms of uh, melting of the glaciers, to conclude unequivocally, like without doubt, 99% or more of certainty that the planet is warming. So this is the temperature changes in the last uh, 100 years, more or less. And, and those temperature changes show that most of the world I, is either in, in yellow or reddish. You know? So most of the world in the last century has seen a, an increasing temperature of between one and two degrees. So that's one piece of evidence. Uh, if we look at rainfall, uh, just one step back here. So the, the planet is warming. This is what we call global warming, you know, the increase of the average temperature of the planet. And the average temperature of the planet has increased in about one degree in the last 100 years. But together with the warming of this planet, we also see a variation in the rainfall of the planet. Uh, different from the previous graphs, you can see here that we have two types of color. In some areas, we see yellowish color, meaning that the rainfall is decreasing. But in some areas, we see bluish colors, meaning that the rainfall is decreasing. So even though the temperature is pretty much increasing everywhere in the planet, it's having different effects in terms of the rainfall. Some areas are getting drier, and some areas are getting wetter. Um, and so some areas that used to be dry now are uh, getting more rain. For example, uh, South America, no? Uh, Cerrado, we were talking about the Cerrado. No, Cerrado is getting more rainfall now. Uh, Argentina is getting more rainfall, the, the Pampas. And so now areas that used to be too dry for agriculture are becoming more productive in terms of agriculture. So at least in the short term, some areas like Argentina, some areas of Canada, are in more favorable condition for uh, agriculture. But in general, we see that the rainfall patterns are very changing, you know? some areas getting dry and some areas getting wet. And so this is what we call uh, climate change, which is an increased variation of the natural variability of the climate derived from the warming that we saw in the previous slide. So we see that the planet is warming, we see that the rainfall patterns are changing. So the next big question is why, no? Because you could say, well, yeah, this, the planet is warming, but that has happened many times in the past. The planet is always cooling and warming, but it could be a natural process that has nothing to do with what we humans have done to the planet. And so the big question is, why is the planet warming? And these graphs are also coming from the IPCC report. And basically, uh, the black line here shows the observed data, what we have measured in the last, in this case, would be one century. You know? In terms of temperature on, on the land, land and ocean, the heat content of the, of the ocean. And so the black line is the observed data. And the, these two are uh, models that try to explain the observed data. If in the model, we only use natural variables, if we only use, for example, solar radiation and uh, other variables that regulate the climate in the planet, then the model looks like the blue line. And you can see that, especially in the last years, the model doesn't match at all what we observe. The only way that we can make the models match the observed increasing temperature is if we add to the model anthropogenic uh, forces, meaning if we add to the model activities related to uh, human, um, uh, yeah, human activities in, in, the, in the planet. 
And so basically, one way to explain this is to say that, yes, in the past, the planet has uh, warmed uh, in, in many, many occasions, but the warming that we are seeing now, especially in the last 50 years, is happening so quickly that it cannot be explained by natural variation alone. The only way to explain the warming, the, the quick warming in the last 50 years, is if we take into consideration of human activity. Therefore, the conclusion of the IPCC is that uh, humans have been, uh, in, in a good way, responsible for the warming observed in the last 50 years. So the planet has warmed in the past, but not as fast as we have seen in the last 50 years. We have seen an increase of one degree in about a century, and that's uh, the fastest we have seen in the recorded history that we can observe. In the past, the planet has a, a warm and cool down, but it usually takes uh, thousands of years to do to do that. No, and and also the warming being uh, taking longer gives more chance uh, for animals and plants to move around to try to adapt. The warming now is happening so fast that animals will not have enough time, in many cases, to move, and they won't have a chance to move. If there is a wall also preventing them from moving. No, so. Animals will also suffer with a war. Sure. <laughs> um, so we know then that the planet warming, we know that we can only explain the warming if we take into account human variables. And then the next question is, well, uh, uh, which humans, no? Who should be playing uh, on this problem? Because this is a global problem. Uh, it means that no matter where the pollution is generated, the pollution spreads out throughout the atmosphere. And this is so because the pollutants, in this case, the so-called greenhouse gases, are gases that have a very long last, uh, lasting life in the atmosphere. You know? And so if we release these gases in the atmosphere, like CO2, for example, carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. these gases remain for, for thousands of years in the atmosphere, so they have enough chance to spread out throughout the planet. And that means that it doesn't matter whether I release the gas here in the US or in China, eventually that gas is going to pollute the entire planet. And so the question is, who is producing these pollutants? Who is polluting the atmosphere with greenhouse gases? The square over here, the large rectangle, represents the entire pollution that we are producing in, in the entire planet. And the different colors represent different regions of the world. So you can clearly see that there are three main regions that are responsible for the majority of the pollution. The largest rectangle uh, represents Asia, uh, and it, this rectangle is so large because China is included here. China is the country that is producing the highest amount of pollution at this moment. We also see here uh, Europe, and we see a big square for Canada and United States. So two single countries, Canada and United States, are responsible for 15% of the pollution. Right next to Canada and United States, we see Latin America and the Caribbean. So there are about 40 countries included here, you know, Central America, South America, the Caribbean. And 40 countries only produce 9% of the pollution compared to two countries producing 15% of the pollution. In this, the, the rectangle for Latin America and the Caribbean is that big because it includes Brazil and Mexico, the two largest polluters in this area. If we were to remove Brazil and Mexico from this square, it would be left as a very small square. Uh, probably two or three percent, you know, the rest of the Latin America without Brazil and Mexico. And if we only focus on Central America, uh, we wouldn't be able to see the square in the graph because Central America uh, only adds less than one percent of the pollution of the world. And so this problem becomes complicated because it's a problem in which the pollution is produced in certain countries, but the effect is felt by, by the entire country. And as we are going to see later in the presentation, uh, the countries that produce less pollution are actually the countries that are receiving most of the impact of the pollution. And so it's really a situation of injustice because some of these countries are polluting more because of their fast economic growth. And that fast economic growth is actually allowing them to confront the problem there. And as a result, uh, these countries are polluting more, but they are more prepared to confront the problem. The countries that are polluting less, including Latin America, eh, Africa, are the ones that are less prepared to confront the situation. 
Okay. Looking now, uh, focusing more in, in Central and South America, uh, this is again historic, what we have seen in the past uh, 50 to 100 years. Uh, we see that the entire area is warming up. So we see a, a thermometer with an arrow up. So temperature is going up. We see that rainfall uh, is very variable. In some areas like Central America, the rainfall is up and down. We see that in a minute. But in other areas like Argentina, I was telling you, the amount of rainfall is increasing. You know? In some other areas, the amount of rainfall is increasing. So similar to what we saw in the, in the first diagram for the planet, uh, the temperature is pretty much increasing everywhere, but the rainfall is changing a lot. And then, of course, the rainfall brings other uh, situations like agriculture changing, increasing or decreasing. Uh, uh, the mosquito here refers to uh, illnesses that the mosquitoes bring, you know, dengue, malaria, chikungunya, zika. Uh, there are so many of them now. And so uh, if we have warmer temperatures, the mosquitoes are happier. And if they are happier, then they spread out more. And if they spread out more, then the illnesses that they spread are also uh, everywhere now. Uh, another, another graph that shows here is uh, the forest, no? how forests have changed. The forest, uh, of course, is not changing because of the climate, at, at least not at this moment. Uh, the forest is changing mainly because of uh, human activity. But it's included in this graph because the changes in the forest, of course, alter a lot uh, the climate, not only the global climate, but also the local climate in the area. So in general, forest is disappearing in most places, except for the Chile area, where forest is increasing mainly out of plantation uh, forest. The other situation that we can observe, focusing more in Latin America, is a huge increase in extreme weather events, especially in the past decade. So this is the number of extreme events, including uh, uh, floods here in blue, in storms in the, the white square. And we can see that uh, we saw a steady increase from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s in terms of the events. But uh, the decade of 2000 to 2009, the amount of events was just uh, amazingly high. And uh, in Central America, we did feel this very much so. No? This was a decade where we had several um, hurricanes uh, going through the area, many tropical storms going through the area, uh, so many of them that they ran out of names in some years to, to name them. And so some of the tropical storms are just called tropical storm number 10, or number 15, because they didn't have names in them. But it was, a, it, was a, it was a decade where we had a lot of uh, problems with uh, flooding and also landslides from, from the rainfall in the area. A lot of uh, uh, casualties also but also a lot of economic impact. Uh, uh, it has been estimated that every hurricane that went through the area impacted the economy of each one of the countries in the area by about three to four percent. And three to four percent is actually the economic uh, growth rate that we observe in our country. That means that every time a hurricane went through, basically we didn't grow in that year. We actually uh, lost some of our economy in those years. So the impact in terms of uh, economy was also very strong. So this is what we have seen in the past, this is what we have been observing. But now let's think about now what's going to happen in the future. Basically, if we have a model of how the climate has behaved in the last 100 years, we can extrapolate that model to the future and try to predict what's going to happen in the future. The only problem is that even though we have good models to show what has happened in the past, there is one single variable that is extremely difficult to model or pretty much impossible to model, and that's human behavior. You know? And we have seen from previous models that if we don't include the human variable, then the models don't work well. And so basically, to be able to predict future climate, we need to be able to model uh, human behavior, which is pretty much impossible. So rather than modeling the future climate, what we do is we do scenarios, you know? So we do a scenario where we are optimistic and we say, yeah, we're gonna do the right thing, we're gonna all come to an agreement and we're gonna start polluting, uh, stop polluting the atmosphere. So that's the optimistic scenario. If we stop polluting the atmosphere right now, the optimistic scenario shows that the increasing temperature is gonna be one degree on top of the one degree that we already have. 
So the optimistic scenario is about a, an increase of two degrees by the end of the century. So if we all stop polluting now, the planet continues to warm up by one degree more. Then we have intermediate scenarios, and then we have the pessimistic scenario, no? The pessimistic scenario is that, no, nothing is happening, or no, we are not PSD, or no, we cannot do anything about it, so let's just continue with business as usual, you know, that's the term they use, business as usual. And if we continue with business as usual, then the average of the model shows an increase of four degrees on top of the one degree that we already have, so that means five degrees on average. But that means that this is the average, with there is a range, you know, some areas in the planet might be warming at higher six or seven degrees. And so uh, the business as usual is a really uh, extreme uh, model. Unfortunately, if we see these models and we see what we have done in the past 10 years, we have been following the route of business as usual. Even though we have all these negotiations every year, even though we have the Paris Agreement now in place, unfortunately, we have been done enough to uh, produce these gases that are polluting the atmosphere. So uh, we are really hoping that the Paris Agreement that was signed a couple of years ago uh, really takes uh, in a, a strong effect to try to move uh, our path from the business as usual down to a more optimistic area. Of course, we saw in the previous graph also that the two main polluters, China and the US, are responsible together for about 30% of the pollution. So if the two main polluters don't take any steps, then it will be hard to achieve the goal. And that's why it's so important that the US does something to change this history of the world. Mm -hmm. If we focus more on South Central and South America, in the future now, we are talking about the future. And now we know that we cannot, in order to talk about the future, we can only talk about uh, scenarios, not models. We have here uh, two scenarios. We have here the most optimistic scenario, the blue line in the previous graph. And we have the most pessimistic scenario, the red line in the previous graph. So optimistic, pessimistic. This is the middle of the century, this is the end of the century, this is temperature, and this is rain. In temperature, we see that everything is either yellow or red or purple. That means that in any scenario, in any moment, it's gonna get hotter. No? So the question is not if it's gonna get warmer, the question is how hotter it is gonna get, no? how warmer it's gonna get. It is gonna depend on what we decide, no? in terms of our pollution. Rainfall, again, we see a lot of variability, some areas getting drier, some areas getting wetter. And uh, basically, these maps are the same, but the, the, um, the pessimistic scenario is basically more extreme in terms of how much rain we see in certain areas or how much the dryness in other areas. But basically, we see that the majority of the region becomes dry. Only a few areas, again, Argentina gets wetter, no? But the Amazon gets drier, that, that, that's, uh, that's bad. Central America actually gets drier. Central America is so little that in this kind of models, it's almost impossible to see. So luckily, we can, we can zoom in a bit more. These models were done by uh, people in Mexico. Guatemala is lucky that we are next to Mexico, so in their models, we can, we can kind of sneak uh, in there. Because these are models that are complicated to run. Unfortunately, in Guatemala, we don't have people with enough knowledge to run these models. So we have to rely on people uh, yeah, from Mexico. And uh, the top uh, shows the current precipitation patterns in the area. You know? So uh, yellow and brown is very low precipitation. Uh, the bluish colors are very high precipitation. We see that southern Mexico and northern Guatemala have a lot of rainfall. This is current data. This is the historical data. And then when we project to the future, basically the, the, the easiest way to, to see it is that the blue colors in Northern Guatemala pretty much disappear. So the predictions for Central America, for Guatemala in this case, indicate that in, at the end of the century, the rainfall is going to decrease at about 20%. You know? Could be higher, could be lower, depending again on what, what kind of decisions we take. Uh, and so less water available for Central America. And that is a problem, of course, no? This graph is a little bit blurry, but it gives you the idea. This, is, this comes from a paper by, by an Italian uh, climatologist. And uh, this guy uh, estimated the areas of the planet that were uh, feeling more of 
of the change in terms of this uh, change of extreme rainfall. And so the bigger the dot in here means that the areas are more susceptible to uh, changing climate. And uh, this paper, this guy concluded that in the, in the tropical area, in this area of the world, the biggest dot really falls in Mesoamerica. You know? So this paper concludes that Mesoamerica is the area in the tropics that would be feeling, uh, it, it, it's actually feeling right now, uh, more extreme changes in terms of climate change. We also see big dots in the northern part of the globe. You know? So all the Arctic regions of the world, northern Canada, northern Russia, are also feeling a lot of these extreme changes. Okay, so this is a little bit of what's going to happen in the future in terms of rainfall and temperature. But now let's look at what is happening now and how we can uh, face the future with the tools that we have now. First of all, let's remember that uh, when we talk about extreme events, we really should think about the risk of being affected by an extreme event. And the risk of being affected by an extreme event, as uh, we see in this graph, actually comes from three different variables. It comes from the amount of hazard. It comes from how much variability we see in the climate, whether natural or human-induced variability. So this area over here represents the number of events, you know, like hurricanes or droughts, right, or wildfires. So this is, this is the physical event that, that, that determines the risk. You know? If we don't have any hurricanes, then we don't have any risk of being flooded by hurricanes. But that's not enough. In order to determine the risk, we also need to have exposure. Exposure means that we need to have people uh, living in the area where the event happened. You know? We can have a hurricane going through the ocean like we found months ago, but what, once the hurricane hit the ocean, the risk is zero because there are no people there. The moment the hurricane goes through land, then we have exposure because there are people there, and then the risk goes down. You know? Exposure then depends on how many people we have and where people live. And unfortunately, we know that the amount of people in the world has been increasing exponentially in the last year. And Central America is not uh, an exception, no? The population of Central America has also increased exponentially. It's basically doubling at a rate of 30 to 40 years. Every 30 to 40 years, the population in, in uh, Central America doubled, meaning that the exposure pretty much doubled, no? Because we have twice a year. And so this is increasing because the variability is increasing. This is increasing because we have more people. And then the other part is the vulnerability. The vulnerability has to do with what kind of people we have, with, with how many tools people have to confront these problems, no? And vulnerability is closely related to money, unfortunately. Unfortunately or unfortunately. So in this case, money makes a difference, you know? You have heard that money is not happiness, but in this case, it's very close to happiness because vulnerability really depends on, on, on your resources to confront these situations, you know? So if you have a hurricane going through um, Haiti, the impact on Haiti is way higher than the same very same hurricane hit in the US, you know? The US gets affected, but the number of people killed is usually 10 times, 100 times higher in, in Haiti than in the US. In the middle, you have Cuba. Cuba is a very particular case, you no, know, because Cuba uh, it's not wealthy at all compared to the U.S., but the number of people killed by a hurricane is very similar in Cuba and in the U.S. And so Cuba is doing something there to reduce the vulnerability, even though their level of income is low. Basically, Cuba is really well organized. You could say it's organized to the military level, no? The people are really, they are really well trained there to, to respond to, to an extreme event. That's, that's why their vulnerability is so low. So anyway, we need to know how many events we have. We need to know if people are going to be in the path of the event. And we need to know if people are going to have a chance to respond to the event. And that is going to determine the risk of being affected by an event. Now let's translate that into, into what we have seen in the past years. This is the risk of being affected by an extreme event in the 80s. And see now what happens in the, in, in the last decade. The, the risk pretty much doubled. But here we are dividing the risk between wealthy countries in black and poor countries in red. And so we see that the risk in wealthy countries increased, but just by a tad, no, just very little. Really, the majority of the increase in the risk came in the developing countries, the, the, the poor countries. 
And so really uh, what we have seen in the last decades is that the risk of being affected by the extreme event in developing countries has doubled pretty much. Whereas in developing in, in, in developed countries, the risk remains relatively similar. So climate change has affected the area in Central America, being a developing region. We saw it there, high risk. Climate change is affecting our water. We'll see that in a minute. It's affecting, therefore, our food security because we need the water to grow our food. Uh, in general, uh, it's increasing the poverty in the area. It's interesting because we, we, we just mentioned that poverty is a, is a factor that will help people confront uh, or not a, a problem, no? So poverty is closely related to vulnerability. But at the same time, this, the same events are uh, feeding back and making people more poor, like we were saying, you know, every time we had a hurricane going to the area, the economy instead of growing would actually shrink. We also have a problem with health. We, we were uh, looking at uh, mosquitoes, no? Um, the data with health is complicated because uh, the spread of in, uh, infectious diseases is a result of many variables. And so it's very difficult to extract the signal, the climate signal of uh, diseases. This is the first attempt to, to uh, combine data in Guatemala. This is for Guatemala on dengue, dengue, uh, uh, a fever uh, produced by, by the field bites. You know? And so we have here in the bars the number of people affected by dengue, and we have here the changes in temperature that we saw. So there is some correlation there, but, but it's still very weak because there are different uh, uh, factors that can affect dengue. Um, what's with the drop-off in mortality from like, Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is an unusual, uh, unusual, unusual year here, and uh, like I said, uh, be beyond temperature, we would have to look at uh, rainfall as well. We would have to look also uh, at other socioeconomic factors to see why there was such a such a little impact here. Uh, in general, what we see with dengue is that it's uh, similar to malaria. Uh, they, those used to be illnesses that were more prevalent in the lowlands in Guatemala. No? near the coastal area. Uh, I had dengue one time uh, in the 90s because I was working in the lowland. Uh, and then dengue was unheard of in, in high altitudes, like Guatemala City is uh, 5,000 feet above sea level on the mountain. So 20 years ago, it was unheard of to have people being sick of dengue. But I had second uh, dengue uh, now living in Guatemala City. So now uh, dengue has become uh, endemic in, 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 the, in the high altitudes. Uh, and so basically, we see that mosquitoes are getting more comfortable going higher up in the mountains. And, and eventually, they will be more comfortable also here. You know, we, we were the other day having dinner and outside, and there were a lot of mosquitoes. So sooner or later, uh, all of these illnesses will also be affected in this area. The other problem, like I mentioned before, is water. You know? at, the, at the very heart of the climate change problem, what we have is a problem of water barrier. Some decades, we have a lot of rainfall, like we saw what we saw in the graph. In the decade of 2000, we saw a huge increase in flooding because of hurricanes and, and tropical storms. I didn't finish the story because if we had done the graph for the next decade, well, we cannot do it because we are still in that decade. But even if we start doing the graph for the next decade, the, the, the bar would shrink again. The decade had been a dry uh, decade. You know? in, in year 2012 was the last year when we had a, a big storm going through the area. And then all of a sudden, it was like somebody closed the, 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 the water, no? the, 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 the key. And, and uh, basically, 2013, 2014 uh, were years uh, very dry, no? extremely dry years. And so what happened is in the last years is that we have seen a lot of stress from uh, lack of water. This is Guatemala, again. Uh, this is uh, Central America. And basically what we see here highlighted is what we call the dry corridor in Central America. And what we see here highlighted in red is the areas that are on the water spread. You know? Guatemala and Central America normally have plenty of rainfall. We always have uh, abundant rainfall, um, but the rainfall is uh, um, very distributed in the year. So six months we have a lot of rainfall, in six months, we have no rainfall, similar to what happened in, in certain areas of Brazil. And so it, the, the blue line here shows the normal situation. No? Under normal circumstances, January, February, March, April, completely dry, no rain. No? Everybody's spreading because there's no water. 
Then uh, farmers plant their, their crops in April because they know that in May, in June, they're gonna have a high peak of rain. And so they have been doing that for centuries. But in the last five years, uh, this is the, the graph from uh, 2014. See what happens in 2014, this peak completely disappeared. So uh, farmers planted their crops in April, May, no rainfall, June, no rainfall, July, no rainfall, a few, a little, a little rain in August, and then September, um, pretty much normal. And so basically, even though it was not a full drought, the problem was that the rain didn't come at the time when the farmer needed the rain. You know? And so the stress that we see here in the dry season extended uh, a few more months, especially in months that were crucial for farmers. You know? Um, so, and the same situation extends to Central America, unfortunately. So, there are several areas in Central America that are really under stress because of the variation of rainfall. What happened with, with uh, uh, dry season like this is that there's a high demand for water. And so, uh, you will say, well, why don't they use irrigation? They use irrigation. No? The, large, the, right, the large farmers, the, the farmers that grow cash crop, no? sugar cane, coffee, uh, on, uh, oil palm. They are larger farmers, wealthy industries that have enough money to, to draw water from river to, to irrigation. Last year, um, they, will, they took so much water from, from this river that they completely dry out. So this is a river over here. This is the river bed and completely went dry. So you can imagine that people were not happy when they, the community along the river were extremely upset when they saw that the sugarcane growers and in the banana growers were basically drying out the river. Uh, and, and so this situation happened because we had five years in a row where we had lower than average rainfall. And this situation actually prompted a lot of protests by communities. And, and out of the situation this year, Congress has been trying to come up with a, a law to regulate how uh, water rights can be distributed between different uh, users or among different users. Uh, this, what, this happened last year, no, no enough rainfall. Uh, this year, we switched again. So this is a picture that was taken just a couple of weeks ago, three, three weeks ago in Northern Guatemala. Uh, so that was uh, the Pacific lowlands. These are the Atlantic lowlands, uh, completely flooded because we had uh, way too much rain in the last September. And so again, we see the same situation where even within a year, one year we have too little water, and the second year we have too much water. So it's basically a problem of water management. I don't know how I'm doing with the time because I don't have a, a watch with me. Oh, this is what I'm We are need to finish at 1.30, no? Yeah, about 1.30. Okay. So, very quickly, uh, in, in a couple of minutes, I'm just going to show uh, some of the work we have been doing with Catherine, actually, and other colleagues, uh, working with farmers uh, who grow coffee in, in, in Mesoamerica. And the idea there in the project uh, was to do several sites in the area to try to understand how farmers were facing changes, but not only climatic changes, but also changes related to uh, economic uh, fluctuations, to price fluctuations in their crops, and also to fluctuations in terms of uh, pest, uh, incidence of pests. And so basically, uh, we did the project for over 12 years in three different phases, in Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, and Costa Rica. Catherine was in charge of the Honduras work. Um, and uh, the, the idea was to ask farmers, so what, what, what is causing you problem? No, what, what are your, what, the question was, what do you think of, of the climate? Is the climate affecting you? No? So we asked that question in 2003, uh, before a series of extreme events happened to the area. And really climate uh, had some response, but it was low. No, it was less than 30% of people saying that. Yeah, climate was important, no? In fact, people would respond, we care more about the climate in Brazil than the climate in Central America, because <laughs> if Brazil has a drought, then we have a better price. <laughs> um, <laughs> we went back and we asked the same question in 2007, after several experiments happened. So what do you think of climate? So climate now got a, a bigger bar, no? It, it affected people more, so people were more responsive. Yes, climate is a problem. But interestingly, even though they have had quite a few storms going through the area, climate was still not the number one concern. The number one concern was always uh, prices, not money, income. So farmers, of course, 
care about how much money they are making. You know? Of course, in an indirect way, the climate is affecting how much money they are making. But what they really see is how much money they have in their pockets. You know? And so that's their main concern. They're also very concerned about being healthy because they know that if they get sick, they won't be able to produce any. And so even though climate is of importance to them, it doesn't come really in the first place. You know? That's one of the interesting information we got from the area. We also did some modeling here. Uh, and, and this shows, for example, the model for Guatemala. We have the same model for other countries. And this is showing uh, how the area is going to be uh, suited or not for coffee growing in the future. As you may know, coffee has to grow at a very specific condition in terms of altitude and temperature, rainfall. And so these are the, the current conditions. So the areas in green are the areas that are suited for coffee growing. So most of the coffee in Guatemala that you drink here when you go to Starbucks comes from, from all of these areas here. But you see that uh, when the climate gets warmer, when the climate gets drier, then some of the green or a lot of the green starts to disappear. So, uh, this is a big concern, especially for people who make a living out of coffee. Uh, people in Europe are very concerned that uh, in 50 years, there will be a, a, a much lower production in coffee now because there, there are area, the areas that are suitable for coffee are disappearing. No? One solution would be like the mosquito. No? The mosquito, when it gets warmer, it goes higher in the mountain. So coffee growers also go higher in the mountain. No? And they are doing that, actually. They're, they're moving higher up in the mountain. The problem is that if you go higher in the mountain, then there's less land available. Sooner or later, you're going to run out of land. Um, I think, well, let, let's go quickly up through these uh, slides and then, then we'll finish. So we were asking people, what, what do you do in terms of facing this problem? And they were saying, some of them were saying, like, ah, this is too much. This is an act of God. So some of the people were saying, yeah, we can do some things to try to, to, to adapt. We were asking them also, what can we do to help you, you know? Uh, and we saw that uh, giving them money would be, of course, a big difference. Although we see that, especially in Mexico and Guatemala, few farmers get uh, financial help. Uh, giving them technical support also would be important. Again, few farmers in the area are getting that, a bit more in Honduras and Costa Rica, belonging to an organization that also helps, of course. You know? uh, but again, many farmers still uh, lack in that support. And so, in general, the, the results of our research show that diversification is important, of course. Uh, having more than one source of income, not just rely on agriculture. Uh, ma water management, financial support, money makes a difference, you know. So these are all um, um, things that we are proposing out of our own research to... And they, they have, most of them are obvious, you know, but most of them are derived from all this work that we did with coffee growers in terms of how they could adapt better to this changing environment. So uh, basically uh, what we see now is that to face the climate, uh, the changing climate in the future, we need to really start uh, adapting to the current climate change. You know, we already see enough changes now that we uh, have to face this uh, certain situation. And so even though we have new challenges with climate change, climate change is giving us an opportunity to try to shift our development process. The problem with Central America, especially in the Northern Triangle, is that uh, a lot of the development has been concentrated in the you know, The poverty levels are still very high. A lot of people living in poverty that makes the country very vulnerable to any of these changes. And so basically, what we need to do is to uh, try to uh, encourage the development of the region, but in a more inclusive way. Try to make sure that everybody is on board. And so, uh, even though uh, oftentimes we hear that climate change is something that was created because people don't want uh, the world to develop. You, know? you want to stop economic growth. Well, we don't want to stop economic growth. We, in Central America, we are urging to kill economic growth to have more wealth. But we need to have more wealth, uh, first of all, that doesn't rely on burning more uh, fossil fuel because that's what we do in the atmosphere. And we have more. We need our energy, we need a more economic growth that really reach out to most uh, people. I think that's the last one, so I thank you for your attention and I apologize because we won't have much time for questions. Okay.